Good evening. I'd like to call the order of the Township of Morris Board of Adjustment, regularly scheduled meeting for March 25th, 2019. Uh, statement of adequate notice in accordance with the Open Public Meetings Act has been satisfied and a statement certifying the same has been executed. Please join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God. Indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Ms. Mantech, can we have a roll call, please? <coughs> Mr. Williams? Here. Mr. Goldberg? Here. Ms. Rothman? Here. Mr. Whitford? Here. Mr. Stout? Here. Mr. Christensen? Here. Mr. Crom? Here. Mr. Cullen? Here. Mr. Loman? Here. Uh, first item we have for consideration is the uh, approval of the minutes from the February 25th, 2019 meeting. Board members, any comments or corrections on those minutes? If not, I'll accept the motion to adopt them. So, thank you, Mr. Williams. We have a second? I'll second. Go ahead. I'll second that. Thank you, Mr. Stout. All in favor? Aye. All Aye. opposed? Motion carries. Meeting minutes from February 25th adopted. Next on the agenda, under public hearings, first application is BA-12-18, Corner Store, Inc. Ms. Mantech, could you please read that application summary into the record? This application is BA-12-18 for Corner Store Incorporated, Block 204, Lot 15, located at 14 Burnham Road, located in the B11 Zone, Section C and D. The applicant seeks a use variance to add two residential apartments above the existing store building, as well as other sites, site improvements. Thank you. Mr. Oller, do we have jurisdiction to proceed with this application? Yes, Mr. Chairman. The applicant has published his notice in proper form, published it timely, served it on property owners within 200 feet, so we do have jurisdiction. Okay. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Brady. Welcome. Good evening, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you. Uh, David Brady of the firm of Brady and Coriel on behalf of the applicant. Um, I understand that we'll have about half of the meeting tonight, so I'll see if I can move this along expeditiously to the board. Uh, as indicated, uh, me, Mr. Brady, we do have a board member with uh, conflict to okay. announce, so we're going to make a <coughs> switch. That's fine. Right. Just for the record, just sure. you have a conflict. Your name is say what? Okay, great. I have a conflict. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's all you need to say. That's right. It's a George. intersection of Burnham and Fairchild in the B11 zone. Uh, it's a one-story block building with a garage which currently has the corner store operation which has been there since the mid 60s. Uh, they serve breakfast, lunch, sell lottery tickets, things of that nature. Um, on top of the building uh, are two billboards which are about 20 feet wide and 12 feet tall. They are non-permitted uses in the zone but they've been there again since the 60s. Um, the proposal is to remove the billboards, to add a second floor to the building, uh, which would contain two apartments. We're going to put a closed stairwell in the rear, which would access those two apartments. Right now, there is a uh, refuse and recycling containers, but they're not in an enclosure. We put them in, we uh, construct an enclosure and put them in that. There would be some reconfiguration of the parking. We'd add some landscaping. And then miscellaneous changes like striping that is currently an unstriped parking lot, adding ballards, and things of that nature. Um, we need both D variances and C variances. The, the main variance is that the apartments are not permitted in the uh, B11 zone. There are 
uh, seven existing nonconformities which are listed in the application in the statement. Uh, the proposal causes, I thought it was three new nonconformities, but I read Mr. Phillips' report today and he found a couple extra, but I'll go through them quickly. One, 75% uh, impervious coverage is allowed. It's currently 73. We are going to go to 76%. Uh, two, we currently have on the Fairchild side of the property um, a setback that is 13.8, where 35 is required. The apartments upstairs, in order to provide usable apartments, are going to be cantilevered over the first floor by two feet. So that gets reduced at 11 to 8 feet. And similarly, on the left-hand side, which is next to the liquor store, that goes from 11.2 feet, which is now compliant to 9.2. Mr. Phillips' report points out that on Fairchild, between this property and the adjacent residential property, a 10-foot buffer is required. We are proposing a buffer that ranges from 5 feet to 7 feet with shrubs. Um, the Refuse and recycling container is going to be a zero foot uh, setback from the adjacent liquor store property. And the parking spaces are 9 by 18 or 9 by 20, whereas the uh, municipality requires 10 by 20. I have with me tonight uh, Jim Maeda, who owns the, the property and, and runs the store, Rusty Schomer, who's our engineer, uh, Lynn Williams, who is our architect, and Ken Nelson, who is our planner. And if, unless the board has some questions at this point, I'm going to ask Mr. Maya to come up. Oh, please proceed. Would you remain standing and raise your right hand, please? You solemnly swear that the testimony you will give to this court will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So I help you, God. Yes. And would you state your full name for the record, please, and spell your last name? James Maya. M A I E C T A. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Have a seat. seated. Mr. Mayor, could you explain to the board your relationship to the corner store? Yes, my parents owned it since 1966. I started working there in 1973. We've had it ever since. Trying to keep it going. And with regard to the, the company itself, the Corner Store Inc., are you 100% uh, owner or partial owner? 50%. And who's the other owner? My sister. Uh, you're fully familiar, obviously, with how the store works? Yes. Are you there every day? Every day. Uh, could you tell the board a little bit about what you do there? We serve breakfast, lunch, a lot of takeout, uh, a lot of the tickets, newspaper, candy, soda. Uh, in terms, you said a lot of takeout. What, what do you think the breakdown is between takeout and stay in? Uh, about 90%. 90%? 90%. Uh, what hours are you open? Uh, six to eight on the week. Uh, Saturday and Sunday, we're open from six to one. Do you have any employees? A total of three. Okay, and who would that be? Uh, me, my sister, and my mother. Totally family operation. <laughs> uh, there was a request during our uh, TRC that a parking a study or count be done. Did you undertake that on your own? Yes. Yeah. I'm going to mark this, Mr. Chairman, as A1 with tonight's date, which is with today's date, which is the 25th of March. Um, do you recognize that? Yes. Would you just describe what that is for the record, please? Would you describe what it is? This is the town of uh, in the cars in my parking lot between my busiest hours are six to one. We have a total of about 100 cars, six to one. After that, it's not as well. Mr. Chairman, if I may, I think there's enough copies for everybody, but I'm not sure. And that's basically people coming in and going out. Nobody can park on the road. Or Jim, why don't we wait a minute until everybody has the, uh, the exhibit. Okay, so you took this count personal? Yes. And you indicated the dates that you took it? Yes. Okay, so you took it on a, a Wednesday, Friday, a Sunday, and a Monday? Yes. Uh, they, 
start at six in the morning? Yes. They run through one in the afternoon? Right. Why did you not do anything counting after one in the afternoon? Because after one, it's just not that many customers after that. Business, Business drops off? Drops off a lot. Um, and what did you do? What do these numbers represent? Well, I counted cars between, like, on the one day, 6 to 6.30, I got, like, two cars. Uh, I just kept counting every, every half hour, and the cars were coming in. And so is that the number of cars that came in? It's the number of cars that came in. Not the number that's actually parked at any one time? No. Did, did you go out and look at what was actually parked during this counting period? Yes. And did you observe that the parking lot was ever full or near full? No. During your experience since uh, 1973 at the shop, has it ever been full? Is that a problem? It's not a problem. Have you ever noticed that whether anybody coming to your store parks on the street anywhere near and walks? No. Do you have any proposal to upgrade the interior of the store? No. Ms. Chairman, that's all the questions I have, Mr. Mayor. Okay, thank you. Uh, board members, any questions? Yes, Mr. Woodford. Uh, you said that no one parks the street. What about like uh, landscapers, trucks, or vehicles like that? Do they pull into the lot or they park into the lot? There's room for them to pull into the lot. I don't think many big trucks in there. I'm thinking about like you know the trucks with the uh, oh, you know, the big, the big thing. The, the, yeah, thing. The, the, the container in the back. Yeah. I don't know where they park. To be honest with you, they can park next door. Maybe I'm not sure. But maybe they are not near. You know, haven't observed where they park. No. I mean, there's no landscapers when I did this kind of Okay, that's true. <laughs> okay, that's the only question. Yeah, board members? Board professionals, any questions? No questions. No questions. Okay, then at this time I'll open up the members of the public. Anybody in the public with questions only of this witness, please come forward at this time. Up to the podium. Seeing none, hearing none, close the public portion. Brady, your next witness. Thank you. Next up, call uh, Mr. Schoenman. swear that the testimony you will give to this board will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so I'll help you that. I do. And would you state your full name for the record, please? Richard B. Schomer, Jr. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I know that Mr. Schomer has testified many times. So yes, certainly the board will stipulate to Mr. Schomer's qualifications as we have accepted him on numerous occasions. As an, as an expert in the field of engineering. Engineering. So I guess to start, Mr. Schomer, if you could describe uh, the zone that this property is in and what zones are nearby. I think that's set forth on the cover sheet. Okay. Um, sure. And then we can go on to maybe describing the building itself, and I see you have some pictures of it. Correct. Okay. Um, so, uh, I won't get to the exhibits on the easel just yet, uh, but uh, uh, the property is, uh, is in the D11 zone. Uh, it's at the intersection of uh, Fairchild Road and Burnham Road, um, and uh, it's it, it has frontage on both of those roads. Um, property contains 9,151 square feet in the B11 zone. The minimum lot size is 11,250 square feet, so it is an undersized lot as it exists today. Um, 
I have on the easel. <coughs> Maybe you want to mark those now. We're up to eight two. Can I mark them both now? Yes. Record though, we, we're marking A2 and A3. Would you describe A2? So, what I just marked as exhibit A2 is the final photo exhibit. It is uh, three photographs. Uh, these were taken by our planner Ken Nelson uh, recently, and I'll, I'll probably use them as well in his testimony. But there's three photographs uh, of the building and the billboards uh, from a couple different uh, angles. And what I just marked as Exhibit A3 is entitled Site Plan Exhibit with today's date. And it's a, uh, thanks. And it is uh, sort of a combination of the site plan, grading plan, and some of the other plan sheets uh, that you have. Uh, probably the site plan uh, is probably the best uh, to, to look at uh, to follow along with that. Sorry, and what sheet is that? Uh, the site plan, which would be sheet uh, three. Sheet three, so yeah. the rendered sheet three. Rendered sheet three, it also shows some of the uh, landscaping uh, provided on, uh, on one of the other sheets. I think before you describe the building, Mr. Uh, Schumer, could you uh, explain to the board what the nearby zones are and the design line runs as compared to the edge of this lot? So if we look at exhibit A3, uh, just to orient the uh, board of property, a Fairchild Road runs up and down along the right-hand side. Burnham Road is on the bottom. So the property is this L-shaped parcel uh, with frontage on Fairchild Road and frontage, so small frontage on, on Burnham Road. As I mentioned, it's in the B11 zone. The B11 zone runs along, along properties uh, fronting on Burnham Road, uh, on this property, the adjacent property, uh, which is uh, which is uh, a rectangular piece, and further to the south along Burnham Road, and also on the other side of Burnham Road. To the north, on the other side of Fairchild Road, is the OSGU zone. That's the Fairchild uh, Fire Company. Uh, the uh, western boundary of our property is also the zone line, and properties to the west are in the RA7 zone, a residential zone. Uh, and further to the end, and that zone continues uh, further to the west. So just to give you uh, some brief description of the property, uh, as I mentioned, it has uh, some frontage on Burnham Road of about 53 feet. Uh, it has about 128 feet of frontage on Fairchild Road. It's L-shaped, as I mentioned. Uh, it's, it's pretty narrow in its depth from Fairchild Road, uh, back from Fairchild Road, but then uh, the back part uh, is deeper uh, and extends extends further back. If you look at the uh, required setbacks for the zone and the building envelope for the zone, what you see, and you can see this on, on your plan as well, the actual building um, available building envelope is a fairly small uh, sliver uh, because of the shape and, and dimensions of the property. It's only this uh, small area that I'm that I'm outlining. Uh, here on the exhibit, uh, and that and is also shown on, on the uh, site plans that you have. Um, as I mentioned, the or as uh, Mr. Brady pointed out, um, the, on the property is the existing uh, corner store building. It's a one-story commercial building. Uh, looking at exhibit A2, these are three photographs uh, of the property. The top photograph uh, shows the corner store building, uh, the one-story uh, commercial building, and the two uh, billboards that are situated on top of that building. Uh, they're approximately 20 feet long and about 12 feet in height, um, and then they sit uh, several feet above the, uh, above the roof line of the building also. Uh, the middle photograph uh, is uh, more of the front of the store. You can see the awning in the front. Uh, the storefront, if you will, of the uh, commercial property really faces towards uh, Burnham Road. Uh, the long side here, as you can see in photograph one, and on the right side of photograph two, uh, that side is, is the side that faces uh, Fairchild Road. So looking again at the middle photograph, uh, you can see the two billboards on the top, uh, the awning with the uh, um, 
small sign that says uh, corner store and the main uh, entrance, uh, as I say, the store front, which faces uh, toward, uh, toward Burnham Road. Uh, you can also see in both the, the top picture and the middle picture, uh, you see that what's around the site is basically all pavement. Uh, it's basically pavement from both Fairchild Road and Burnham Road, basically right up to the building. But what you see is basically a uh, drop curb or no curb all along the frontage uh, on both Fairchild and Burnham. And really it's unstructured, uh, not a formal parking situation, although parking occurs on both, uh, both the frontage toward uh, Burnham Road. As you can see in the middle photograph, there's a car uh, head on toward, toward the building. And in the, in the top photograph, you can see cars uh, head on toward the building coming off of, of Fairchild Road. Uh, and then just while we're on this exhibit, looking at the, uh, the bottom photograph on A2, uh, this photograph was taken uh, from Hanover Road. And the purpose of this is to really show that uh, you can see the building and you can see the billboards as well uh, from, uh, from Hanover, F Hanover Avenue, which is further to the, uh, to the north. Uh, and then just going back to exhibit A3, again, you can see uh, from Fairchild Road and Burnham Road, uh, it's basically pavement uh, from those roads up to the building. Uh, as I mentioned, it has the one-story commercial building. Toward the back of the property is a small one-story accessory garage structure, and that, that structure is used for storage. Um, the site is basically flat, uh, level, level in topography. Uh, any, there's no existing drainage features on the property. It generally drains toward, toward the adjoining street, but there's no uh, significant environmental features really to be, to be concerned about. There are a number of uh, existing nonconformities with respect to the property. Uh, and that's due to the, uh, to the shape of the property and some of the existing features. As I mentioned, the lot area is nonconforming. Uh, where the D11 zone requires 11,250 square feet, we have 9,151 square feet. The lot width on Burnham Road is substandard uh, at a little less than 53 feet, where 75 feet is required. The lot depth, and we averaged out the lot depth to a little more than 83 feet, where 100 feet is required. The front yard setback off of Fairchild Avenue uh, to, the, to the building uh, is 13.8 feet, where 35 feet is required as a front yard setback. And similarly on Burnham Road, uh, the front yard setback required is 35 feet, and we're at 19.2 uh, feet. And these are all uh, existing conditions. Uh, the garage in the rear uh, has some nonconformity with respect to the side yard setback for an accessory garage of 8.3 feet, where 10 feet is required. Uh, the combined side yard when we incorporate the garage uh, is also at 17.2 feet versus 25 feet. And the rear yard setback uh, from the garage to the rear uh, property line is at 5.9 feet. And the rear yard setback required in the zone is, uh, is 25 feet. So I just wanted to outline uh, those for you. Uh, the proposal is to uh, uh, construct a second story addition onto this building. That is an expansion into the of two feet into the side yard, correct? That's correct. Okay. Correct. Similarly, yeah, that does that lines up with the overhang actually at that location. And uh, and I'll mention the uh, well, the variances in a minute. Um, the, as I mentioned the parking right now is really unstructured, unformalized. Uh, there's no striping, there's uh, no delineation of parking spaces, there's no formal walkways. There's really no landscaping on the Fairchild Road, Burnham Road side. So as part of these improvements, we're gonna formalize all of that. We're gonna make improvements. The, the parking spaces on both Fairchild Road and Burnham Road will be formalized with uh, striping. Uh, there will be a, uh, an ADA accessible parking space created at the front. Uh, there will be walkways created uh, uh, from the corner of Fairchild and Burnham Road. There will be walkways created uh, there's, right now, there's actually a, a, a crosswalk area uh, across uh, the intersection and along Fairchild Road. So that will be formalized with a walkway that comes off of that intersection and a new walkway uh, in front of the building. 
Uh, there'll be decorative bollards placed in front of the building uh, to keep cars from uh, poking too far forward and, and hitting the building and also to protect uh, uh, the pedestrian walkway that's going to be created across there. Right now, as you can see from the photographs, there's no nothing but pavement in the front. So we're going to actually take this opportunity and uh, create a small uh, a landscape area, put some plantings in there, put a tree in there, and we think that will help, uh, help the appearance of the, uh, of the site uh, uh, over what's there today. Uh, at the rear of the, uh, of the building, uh, we're also going to add landscaping, formalize the parking, uh, create a walkway for the entrance uh, into the uh, access for the residential units, uh, stripe, put formal striping along the parking spaces along that side, uh, and create a formal two-way access uh, to a couple of parking spaces which will be situated in front of the garage. The garage will stay, it will continue to be used for uh, storage use only. Uh, so we're creating a new pavement, uh, resurfacing the parking lot, creating new pavement at the back. Right now there's some grass areas, some gravel areas, it's really not all that well delineated, but we're going to create uh, delineations between the, the pavement, uh, the parking spaces, uh, landscape spaces. Uh, we're going to create a, a landscape buffer along this western border. Right now, and, and Mr. Phillips points this out in, in his report, the grass area that's there right now is, is wider than, uh, than what we're going to have. Right now it's about 10 feet. We're going to reduce that to about 5 to 7 feet. 5 feet in this area and 7 feet towards the back. But we're going to enhance it uh, with landscaping. We're going to uh, plant the uh, a row of shrubbery all along that uh, common property line to act as a, a buffer and a screen between uh, this property and the adjacent property to the west, which as I mentioned is in a residential zone. Um, so we're formalizing this, formalizing the parking and, and the uh, access to the site. Uh, we're going to construct some additional depressed curb along the Fairchild Road frontage uh, to, uh, to delineate between the pavement on site and that off site. <coughs> Uh, the dumpster, which is going to be in the back, uh, is we're creating that, putting that in an enclosure. Uh, right now, there's a dumpster that sits out uh, at the back of the building, which sits on the pavement. So we're going to put that in an enclosure with a solid fence and a gate, and that'll be on a new concrete pad located uh, at this at this location, uh, just uh, adjacent to the uh, to the building. Uh, as I mentioned, a couple of parking spaces will be created in front of the garage. We're going to add some. Uh, take away some uh, gravel areas and so forth around the garage and, and add some, uh, some lawn areas there. So that'll, that'll be an improvement. Uh, as part of the improvements, we're also going to put some, uh, a couple of lights on the side of the building. And these will be new uh, LED fixtures, uh, downcast type uh, lights on the side of the building to provide some lighting uh, along that side and one uh, in the front. Um, by the awning. Those will be low lights. They're only going to be about 10 feet to off the ground. Uh, so they'll be low and, uh, and simply provide some on-site lighting. Is there currently any uh, drainage structures on site? There are no drainage facilities on site. Uh, and we're going to be adding a new drainage, uh, an inlet uh, with the dry well and to collect some, some runoff from the site. So that'll be an improvement over the, over the present conditions. Um, and result in less runoff from the site than occurs today. The proposal results in some variances, as you've heard. So certainly, the residential use requires relief, and our and our planner will address that uh, and go through and go through all of these in more detail. Uh, the addition of the second story and the overhang uh, results in the need for uh, setback relief from Fairchild Road, uh, the, where it's currently 13.8 um, uh, feet, it'll go down to 11.8 feet. Uh, on the south side of the building, uh, adjacent to the other commercial building, uh, that uh, overhang will be uh, 9.2 feet, and the addition at the back will be, will be 9.2 feet from the property line where 10 feet uh, is required, so that's slightly uh, substandard. The reconfiguration of the parking, formalizing the parking area, uh, creating, uh, delineating everything in the back, uh, 
creating the walkways and everything results in a slight increase in impervious coverage where 75% is permitted. Uh, we're currently at 73% and we're going to be uh, slightly over that at uh, 76%, so just 1% uh, over. And as, uh, as, as I just mentioned, uh, to help mitigate the impacts from increase in impervious coverage, we're providing uh, some drainage on site and, and actually even though the coverage goes up, the net result is that there will be less runoff from the site uh, in the after condition than, uh, than currently. Um, the dumpster, as mentioned, uh, that'll be at this one corner, will be right at, uh, right at the property line, so that's the zero setback. And if you go out there and look at it today, this is really, although we've shown on the exhibit, the gray area where the pavement is, that actually extends onto the neighboring property. So really, uh, there's, there's pavement that runs uh, onto the neighboring property, so it's less, uh, um, less visible in sense of where the property line is and, and so forth than, uh, than just from the zero foot setback. Um, the, I mentioned the, uh, the buffer uh, on the west side, um, and uh, as mentioned, that's, uh, that requires a relief where 10 foot buffers require them to be a five feet to seven feet, but we're enhancing that with, uh, with new landscaping. And lastly, the parking spaces uh, on the front on Burnham Road will be at nine by 18 feet, and on the side uh, by Fairchild Road will be nine by 20 feet, where the ordinance requires 10 by, 10 by 20 feet. Um, uh, I think that pretty much goes through the uh, the site changes. Uh, In your opinion, it, will the nine by eighteen and nine by yes. twenty foot spaces operate? Yes, uh, we we commonly use those size spaces, um, and we commonly request the relief for those size spaces uh, from from the township ordinance department. I think that's all I. The storage in the garage, are you familiar with what type of materials are stored there? I think it's kind of miscellaneous storage that uh, Mr. Maeda has for either his operation uh, um, inside or other sort of miscellaneous storage. No, nothing specific. Um, is there a reason that area to on the east side of the garage needs to remain paved? Uh, on this side? Yeah. Uh, it's pavement today. We we're leaving it that way. Um, it's used kind of commonly with the adjacent property, and we, uh, we kind of didn't want to interfere with the access that kind of occurs in that area. Uh, that is kind of shared by the neighboring property owner. Uh, so we were leaving it that way for that, for that reason. Not, not to impair the continued access to the back of the adjacent commercial building. But we'll ask. Yeah, but when you have a coverage variance, uh, I don't know if that's a rational okay. justification. <laughs> I think we'll ask that question. Okay. Um, did you look at any other possible locations for the uh, uh, recycling and garbage enclosure? Uh, we did. We played around with this back area quite a bit. We did want to provide a couple of parking spaces uh, in the back area. We wanted it to be easily accessible so that when you, uh, the garbage truck or recycling truck pulls up, um, they have easy access to the front of it. Um, and that at the end of the day, it really seemed to be a good orientation and layout for it, uh, even though the back corner does, uh, does just touch the, uh, with the corner of the property does just touch the uh, recycling pad. Um, we thought that was a good location for access, um, given that we wanted to provide these other, other amenities. There's a turnaround area at this, right behind the building uh, for access uh, to allow for uh, the cars that are, would be parked in these two spaces by the garage so they could back up and, and exit. So we, were, we did look at that and kind of played with that a fair amount in terms of how we could lay that out. We thought this was a good layout. Uh, did you look at the possibility of between the garage and the two parking spaces there? 
when you say between the garage? Uh, the north side of the garage. The uh, grass area to be receded as needed, yes. This area? Yeah. Well, if we, if we put it in that area, uh, it'd be it would be blocked by the parking spaces. So that, that's the difficulty with that. Well, the difficulty where it is right now, it's by the door to two proposed residential units, and it's right on the property line. Yeah, the, door, the access door is on this side, um, facing towards uh, Fairchild Road. Uh, so it's not right next to those. You don't actually say right, right next to it. So right at the back. No, I, I understand. Yeah, I understand. I just wanted to point out that the, the, there's a, you come into the walkway and onto a step, and then come into the into the rear that way. Um, yet, if we put it here, these two parking spaces then become uh, difficult, to, or access to the to the dumpster becomes difficult with if there's any, any cars in that location. Um, and then it's right in front of that building. There are. Uh, there is a garage door there that makes access into that building really impossible. Uh, although there's no cars pulling in and out of that well, garage that's building. Well, exactly I was going to say, if you're not going to, if you're going to have a grass area there, you're not pulling cars in. Correct. How about shift it a little, you know, down, not directly in front of the garage? In, in this area? Is that what you're By the garage, yeah, that area from the, in front of the garage, in yeah, down towards the area where you don't want to remove the pavement. You don't want to remove the pavement? Um, yeah, I and mean, again, we were kind of keeping this open for, for common access and circulation. Well, uh, that's going to be the justification. Yeah. We need to hear the whole story of what's happening next door and how it ties in. We could, we could take a look. I mean, the concern is the, is the setback. The concern is the setback of the zero and the close proximity to the proposed residential entrance. Okay. Okay. Mr. Chairman, I've spoken to Mr. Mayetta. Uh, he has no particular objection to taking up some of that pavement and making a grass around the garage there. Uh, he indicated to me that the, the garage is used for miscellaneous storage, sometimes from the store, sometimes personal things. He owns the house, uh, right, or I guess it's yeah. to the north or west. Sometimes he'll have a tenant who will want to store something there. It's a small house, so it's just miscellaneous things. Uh, he'd like to be able to get some access okay. to the garage door and not have it completely... Uh, blocked by a, a relocating the refuse area, mm -hmm. but other than that, he has no strong feeling about taking up some pavement or, or changing the refuse location. Okay, thank you. Board members, any questions? Yes, Mr. Paul. I have a question about the garage entrances. Where are the entrances in the, in the garage building? There's a door on this side facing Fairchild Road. Is that a garage door? There's a garage. It could be used for a yes. car? Yes. But there's no intention to use it for cars Correct. in the future. And on the side that faces to the, what is that, the east, is that, are there any entrances there? On this side? Yes. No, I don't believe so. And could the owners of the other commercial property, and it is Mr. Mr. Park's um, comment as well, could the owners of the other commercial property next door use that garage? No. No. Yeah, they, they don't use it. No. I have a question. Um, yes, Mr. Bowman. I just want to clarify. I think I heard you say that there's going to be no change to the existing footprint, but then there was also discussion about adding that vestibule on the back side. Does that not count towards the existing footprint? This does. This does count for the footprint. I was really thinking of the outline. On the sides, uh, on, the, on the two sides, but you're you're correct. The addition in the back does add to the footprint on the ground. That that's the only place where it does actually. And in terms of the ADA space that's um, located in the front, did I hear you allude to the fact that there will be walkways? So if a, a resident residents were parking on the front, or if I don't even know if residential parking would be allowed. But, if they were, if there's a way to access to to get around the back without having to walk around the whole periphery of all the parking. Uh, we don't anticipate residential parking in the front. We would anticipate, and we're not proposing to assign resident spaces <coughs> to the residents, but the two spaces at the back and the ones nearest the door would be the ones 
was logical to be used by the residents. Uh, and you can access uh, from from those onto the walkway and then uh, and then to the building. Thank you. And with regard to the spaces and the uh, layout of the spaces, Mr. Schumer, in terms of uh, what I'll call complementary parking demand, does this does this work in terms of engineering and circulation and all? Because we have a use that runs from uh, nine to eight, or excuse me, six to eight or six to two, and then we have uh, residential use. Yeah, and I should have mentioned that uh, in terms of parking, there's right now again it's unstructured, so it's hard to say exactly how many parking spaces there are today. It's probably 12, 13, 14 parking spaces, something along along those lines. Uh, we're showing 15 parking spaces when we do the calculation based on the ordinance requirements for both the commercial use and the residential use. Uh, we're required to have 14 spaces, uh, but we we have 15 spaces on the on the site. Uh, and there's a typo on the plan that actually says it's 14 or there are 15 spaces uh, on the uh, on this on this plan and on the site plans shown. And that's assuming full occupancy by both of those in accordance with the ordinance requirements. Often you see some, I'll say, shared parking uh, during the day. Uh, uh, residents may not be home, and those spaces are available, but that's. While that may happen, that's really not even a concern here because we have the full complement of parking spaces available as required by the ordinance. Any other board members? Yes, Mr. Woodford. I'm looking at these plans and it looks like all the parking spaces uh, go into the uh, right of way. Is there any problem with that? You're right. They do. <laughs> and that's, um, that, that's, that's something we couldn't cure. <laughs> um, and that's how the parking arrangement has been for decades. Uh, and, uh, and we propose to continue that. They do extend, uh, extend it to the right of way, you know, given where the property line is. Uh, that's an existing condition. We, we really can't fix it. And that's due to the location of the building and the shape of the, of the property and, and arrangement of the parking. Um, we discussed this with uh, uh, with Mr. Slate and uh, discussed this in the TCC meetings. Uh, uh, it's functioning well. Uh, there have been no particular problems uh, that anyone is aware of uh, with respect to operating in this fashion. Um, and the turnover, uh, um, most, as you heard, most of the customers, it's a takeout. Um, so, uh, but there's been no particular issues uh, over the years with that, uh, so we, we do propose to continue that, but yes, that's, that's correct. Your observation is correct. I guess my follow-up would be with uh, Mr. Slater's propriety. Any, not, plan, not to any plans to widen Fairchild? <laughs> no, Burnham Road was reconstructed uh, recently, and I believe at that same time we extended the curb around the radius on uh, on Fairchild. But I'm just going to double check the width on that. I mean, we there were some discussions early on when we were considering the uh, the plans for the reconstruction of Burnham Road. Um, you know, because of the existing store location, both the corner store and the, uh, and the store next door has always functioned, um, you know, that way. We, we kicked around the, uh, you know, the sidewalk and doing an apron, um, and, and we leaned away from that just, uh, you know, because we felt it had the potential to kind of interfere with the parking that's existed there for a long time. Um, and, and then we just maintained the, uh, the asphalt uh, in that area. On the neighboring property, just to point out, uh, the neighboring commercial property, uh, similar type of parking arrangement takes place. So you see that in front of uh, the corner store as well as in front of the, uh, the adjacent property. And the neighboring property is a commercial uh, operation? Yes. Store? Yes. And I'm just checking the, uh, the curb line on Fairchild Avenue. We have that set at 28-foot uh, road width, which is standard for a residential roadway with, with parking on one side. So it's, it's, it's not as if Fairchild is, uh, is, is choked off on that side. We, if we were, uh, you know, at some point we'll finish off uh, the improvements on Fairchild in that neighborhood uh, more to the west 
and, and we would hold that 28 foot width, we wouldn't go wider. But the, the similar situation exists, uh, uh, you know, on sidewalk right now, there's a sidewalk on the opposite side of Fairchild where the firehouse is located. Um, what's in the rest of the neighborhood, I'm not sure. I don't think there's really any sidewalks in, in that neighborhood. There may be some piecemeal stuff, but it's it's not a uh, you know formalized sidewalk network, and, and we really have to look at the whole neighborhood to see how we would handle sidewalks. Yes, Mr. Roller. So, Rusty, if you eliminate the pavement along the east side of the garage, um, does it also have the effect of eliminating the impervious coverage barriers? We could, if, if we take out this pavement, we could take out enough, I believe, to eliminate the impervious coverage variance, yes. And, and, and it holds the 75 percent correct. Yes, but uh, is there going to be any kind of walkway or anything to the uh, access the garage, or is it just going to be walk across the grass? Just uh, across the grass because it's not intended for use on a regular basis. There's no vehicles to go in and out, so it would just be a uh, lawn area there. Any other board members? Board professionals? Just to follow up on the uh, on the garage, um, I've just looked at it through uh, um, Google Maps earlier in the day, and it, uh, it looked like it was in need of some repairs. I don't know what time or, or how many years ago that was taken. Are there any improvements proposed for the, uh, the garage? We hadn't proposed any, no. And the, uh, it, it, I saw there was a residential style door on it, it's, it would never be used for any type of residential use. Correct. Could not be used for residential use. Correct. Uh, no further questions. Uh, will the residential parking be assigned or will it be catch as catch can? Uh, it was not intended to be assigned. Uh, we would expect that probably that, that they would uh, park uh, closer to their entrance, so the couple spaces by the garage or the, or the couple, uh, the few uh, on that side off the Fairchild is what we would expect. And that kind of is different than where the access is for the commercial, which is the front door off uh, Burnham Road. So most people wanting to access the commercial use will park either right on the four spaces on Burnham Road or the ones closest. Uh, so those are the ones that are used first, certainly. Uh, and most commonly for the commercial use. So we would expect these would tend to be, remain open and that's what we would expect the residents to park. Would it make sense to, to assign the two closest to the garage to the residential? Um, we uh, just a thought. could. Uh, it would seem to be the... Yeah, we, don't have any, we don't have location. any objection to that. Right. <laughs> I don't think it makes sense to assign others because sometimes they might be used by uh, customers, sometimes they might be used by residents, but the two near the garage would be, could be assigned if the board wants that. That's why I suggest that. Thank you. Yeah. With, with signage. Well, assuming the board agrees with you, Mr. Right. That's just a suggestion. So you're talking about assigning with signage? I'm sorry? Right? Not just assigning it in a lease, but there'd be signage? I think you, I think you right. put signs there. there. Right. Uh, I'm not sure what they said yet, but yes, you put some signs there. Yeah. Nothing further. Nothing else? Okay, at this time I will open up to members of the public for any questions of the engineer this evening. Questions only this time. Please come forward. Seeing none, hearing none, close public forum. Okay, thank you, Mr. Schumer. Next, I call Lynn Lane.
you remain standing and raise your right hand, please? Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you will give to this board will be the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth? So help you God. Okay. Would you state your full name, please? My name is Lynn Williams, and I'm representing Carolyn Young, who is the architect. I worked for Carolyn Young. She put me to the Lynn, could you uh, explain to the board your professional and educational background and your involvement in this project? Uh, I've been in involved with the project from the beginning. I am a registered architect in the state of New Jersey. I um, have a master's degree in architecture. I've been practicing for 37 years. Have you testified before boards as, uh, as an architect in the past? Yes, I have. You testified before this board or, or not, not before, before the planning board? board? No. no. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Chairman, I would ask that the board accept Ms. Williams as a, an expert with regard to the architectural plans. Board members, any questions? Okay, sir, thank you. Chief. Okay, then if you would, then would you uh, describe uh, what the proposal is here from an architectural point of view? I'm going to walk over there. That's fine. <clears throat> and are you going to refer to the floor plans first? Yes, that okay. is our, our sheet. Z1 that was submitted as part of the application. Okay, so it's the same exactly as we Exactly. Mm -hmm. um, as has been uh, stated, we are proposing a uh, one-story addition over the existing uh, one-story uh, corner store. The addition will have two apartments and an a common stairwell down to the grade level. The corner store will remain as it is, with its public entrance at the front and a service entrance at the rear. Um, the two apartments are each going to be 970 square feet, so they are modest size. They are two bedrooms, one bathroom each, and they have um, an open plan living room slash even kitchen, public uh, common area in each unit. Um, the, there is a proposed two foot overhang over the long sides of the corner store um, uh, along each unit. It will overhang the existing building. And the reason for that is to achieve enough width to actually have functional units. Um, the existing building is quite long and narrow, um, and it doesn't lend itself to a very efficient floor plan. So we lose a lot of space to long hallway in order to get access to rooms that can have windows. Um, so that's one of the reasons why in order to achieve usable room sizes, we need to expand over the other building below. The other reason is um, the corner store has a certain height we need to get up to that. So we need a certain number of stairs. Uh, we have a limitation of the existing service entrance here and setbacks here um, along the side yard. And we have a certain number of steps we have to have to get up to this level. So <clears throat> actually, we are kind of at a minimum in terms of the landings we've provided in order for them to be you know, safe and usable. Um, we've achieved some of the stair through exteriors in order to give an indication of what the material is to look like um, together. Okay. And, um, so if you could go around and describe the various elevations then, both as to the materials, what the design, what design elements you were trying to achieve, and what the colors are. Right. Um, in the building, we have we are trying to sort of separate and create separate identities for the two uses of the building. So corner store at the front, we are retaining the original awning and the signage um, to establish a strong retail identity at the front. The Fairchild elevation, um, we have a separate identity for the residential entrance. It's a little more residential in character with railings, a little porch, um, and we have our vinyl siding material, which we're using on the upper level to um, tie in to a more residential character. The existing corner store 
is actually a brick structure. The bottom <coughs> has a stucco finish. Uh, the front actually has painted brick finish, and we're proposing retaining all those finishes. They're durable, they make sense at a ground plane, especially a tight site like this where there's parking close to building. But um, we are utilizing a lot more residential character on the upper level, and that's really to tie into the residential scale and character of some of the, um, a lot of the neighboring buildings and homes in the area. <clears throat> So what, what we're proposing is um, gabled roof, pitched roofs, which tie into the residential character, um, double hung windows with divided lights. We have a lot of trim boards, um, brackets, uh, and kind of features like that that lend some character and scale to the building. We have cross gables in a couple of locations along the sides and at the rear. Again, to break up the long roof line and add some visual interest um, to the facade. In terms of the colors, um, we're utilizing the different contrasting materials to kind of break down the scale, but we're also tying them together color-wise, so it reads as a whole. So we have a light sand color proposed for the bottom level, and a deeper version of that same color for the upper level. So there's a lot of changes of texture going on, but we sort of have a common uh, color palette, I would say. We're picking up on those green accents of the existing awning, with our window color and some of the door colors. And then the trim is proposed to be a cream color. The roof would be asphalt shingle, um, medium tone of kind of a grayish brown. And no billboards on the roof? No billboards. I have no further questions. Um, I'm actually trying to figure out what are we calling the height of the existing billboard? The height of what? The height of the existing billboard. I know we said the billboards were 12 feet. There's a space between the billboards and the roof, and what's the height of the existing um, store building? Um, hmm. Trying to add all those together. I don't have that on this drawing. Uh, have the height of the existing building? I, uh, <coughs> I don't know how indicated, but I believe it is around 12 and a half feet. <coughs> I believe the parapet is not a, it's, I, that's why I'm not fighting. Mm -hmm. I know that it's 10 feet 5 inches from the grade to the top of the structure, and then there's the parapet on top of that. Directed into leaders uh, to the drywall. 
I'm not sure who asked the question. I did. Oh, okay. <laughs> Currently, there is no dry well, and the stormwater from the current roof just runs onto the parking lot? Correct. <coughs> Um, on the exterior, is the intention of the original, the existing building, let's say now you reference the stop over the outside of the building to maintain that well. Um, in walking the property, <coughs> I did notice it does need some work on that. Is the intention to refinish that and yes. reface all of that and make that all? Yes, where it isn't in good enough condition. Yet. And then on um, this bottom drawing here, um, I guess what I'll refer to as the alleyway between the two stores. Yes. The, um, to me, it looks like maybe at one point in time those were windows that were either plywooded over. Or could you just explain what those are? They are mean? recesses in, in the facade, so I believe they are probably formerly windows that have been blocked in, but they didn't make them flush. They kind of left the vestige of the former opening. And we were not proposing to make them flush, given that it's an alleyway between two right. commercial buildings. Right. They're probably recessed about four inches. And I don't know if this applies to the discipline of architecture, but from the use of the building, I believe there's the, in, the, in that alleyway there's an exhaust, I guess, that maybe services the, the kitchen area downstairs. Yes. Is that correct? That seems, is that correct that it's located right underneath the, I guess, one of the new residential windows? Is that something that from just the design perspective comes into play? Uh, I, I think desk, we were intending to leave that. It projects pretty far off the building. Um, and I don't know that it can be relocated. Um, yes, okay, thank you. I wasn't sure I understood what you said about the stairs being added and the difficulty with getting the stairs to go all the way up to the level where the apartments will be and what limitations that will under oh, consideration. Um, well, we need uh, like 17 stairs from, from entering the building. We need 17 stairs to get up. The limitations are we need a certain amount of space once you just to get in the building and in a door and stand there and close the door behind you. Then get up the stairs, minimum landing width, you know, by the code. And then at the top of the stairs, we don't want to be right, on, right at this doorway with a stair because that wouldn't be safe. So we have about <coughs> 16 inches offset of the first step. So it's a function of how high the risers are and how wide the treads are plus how big the yes, landing areas have to which be. Which is all dictated by the building code. And we were quite tight everywhere on this site. Um, I believe there's an existing gas meter here. Uh, there's, there's this door here. So, you know, we, we've really tried to fit the site as well as we can to get up to this second floor. So is that an explanation as to why you needed to extend that extra piece of building, the new piece, two feet out, yes. like, like yes. the overhang? Yes. If the door, uh, if the service door were to be moved around to the other side of the building, just around the corner, would that alleviate the problem? Would you be allowed then to move it by the entire structure? Uh, well, we were trying to respect the place and put some gas meter right here. I don't show it on my phone, but that's what's limiting the face of this uh, porch. Because gas yeah, service is in uh, the building right there. Yeah. Thank you. So, yeah. uh, I just have a follow-up question. You had mentioned the gas service. I don't see anywhere on the drawings um, location, maybe they're not called to be on the drawings, for a furnace or um, a closet with heat or furnace. Um, we have a lot of attic space because of our roof. We have H12 pitch, so we have attic space we can have equipment in. And then there's a full basement under corner store where they have their equipment. Thank you. Anybody else? What questions? Mr. Chief? Oh, sorry. Is there, um, is there any additional lighting? 
outside of the on the outside of the building, the we would probably have um, a ceiling fixture on the porch to light that entrance. Nothing on this uh, on the uh, There are two lights shown on the first That's field of the Yeah, those. No, nothing and there's one shown on the back for the parking area the rear. I think Mr. Schomer indicated there were going to be shielded lights, LED types, so they're very controlled. Mr. Slade. A uh, follow-up on that uh, lighting question. Uh, your fixtures are much more attractive than the ones that uh, Mr. Schomer is showing. Is it possible to have make sure that the, <laughs> no offense, engineer's practical box type fixture, but the architect is showing a much nicer fixture? The applicant stipulate that if there was an approval that they would do an architectural type fixture. Yeah, that's fine. We can do a decorative sort of fixture in consultation <laughs> with Mr. Slate or Mr. Phillips or whoever's. Uh, more aesthetic and less practical. <laughs> uh, the uh, follow-up to Mr. Goldberg's question, uh, I, I did not look at the uh, area through the alleyway, but are some of those windows covered with plywood, or will they be finished with a stucco finish to be somewhat similar? And uh, once those stucco repairs are completed on Fairchild side of the building, is it painted then to give it the color? I'm assuming that's the case, but uh, I guess Somehow or other form that into a question for you. I mean, it, it's, it's all painted stucco, various states of repair, but the idea is that it's all going to be painted stucco along the sides. Um, if, if that's plywood now, the intention is that it would be stucco. So okay. It's a consistent finish, so it doesn't look like a boarded up building. Thanks. That's what I was hoping to hear. <laughs> Uh, do you know, I see right now there's an existing uh, overhead service. Do you know if it's the service is going to need to be upgraded? And I guess my follow-up on that would be if a new electrical service is required, um, is the applicant willing to put that to underground rather than having an overhead service? Okay, you've got a line I don't know if the answer to whether the service will need to be upgraded. Um, see that they're conferring on the engineering aspect of it. Mr. Chairman, uh, yes, Mr. after talking with uh, Mr. Schomer and Mr. Mayetta, if we have to upgrade it and we have to run wires and all that, we'll, we'll run them on the ground. Okay, thank you. And I guess the last uh, question I have for the architect, are you familiar with the existing garage and the condition of the garage? We did not really focus on that. Okay. If it's in need of repairs, I guess this goes back to the applicants. You know, if it needs a coat of paint or some sort of repairs, the applicant will it. Coat of paint's easy, Mr. Slate. I'm not sure what to commit to beyond that, though. And the coat of paint should be in keeping with the color scheme that's proposed for the building as well? I'd say that makes sense. And probably also the same color scheme for the dumpster and uh, recycling enclosure? I had uh, no further questions. Mr. Phillips? Can we go back to the rendering? So um, I'm looking, let's take the Fairchild Avenue frontage. Yes. And um, I guess I'm just dealing with the disconnect between the first and the second floor, um, and I get that the you know the first floor is built. I get that there's no fenestration on the first floor, but I'm just having issues, and I don't know what the solution is to be honest with the with the disconnect, adding the residential story, which clearly has a residential feel. You know, there's a roof line, and. Um, I get what you were trying to do with the color differences, but I don't know what else you could do to dress up that portion of the facade. And I, I just throw that out as a, as a question because I'm sort of, my aesthetic sensibilities are just kind of grappling with that. Although I understand the dilemma from a practical standpoint. So I just, as an architect, is there anything else that you feel that you could have done to dress up 
that facade on the first floor now that you have the second floor facade which has a, a residential feel and look and materials and so forth. Well, it looks like we need a window right in the middle of the other two, but that's where the dividing wall is. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I guess my response to that would be, um, and I don't know if any of the other board members feel that way. No, no, I, I definitely saw what you were okay. talking about. Well, we are trying to tie them together with color, but, but main, they maintain a difference in texture. But this type of um, separation of the stories is kind of um, historical for homes of built in the 30s and 20s. Um, it's kind of consistent with the age of the neighborhood that surrounds. You see it a lot. Um, I think the trim board helps a lot, and I think the brackets actually help a lot. The, the thing you have to remember is when cars are parked there, you're not yeah. going to see the bottom half of that wall. I was thinking of that. And Believe me, I was so thinking that. So that's kind of why a lot of the attention yeah. has been put on the upper part of the building, because it's kind of a waste of effort on the lower part if it's all blocked by cars. So you're going to get a strong shadow line where the overhang occurs, but you're going to get the relief of having these brackets yeah. project forward. Maybe it's just that it's the lack of fenestration and, and richness and detail. It's, but I, I understand, you know, why you designed it the way you designed it, and you know what you've uh, attempted to do to kind of address it. But uh, it's still, it's it's that first floor relative to the second floor is stark. That's all I have on that. We need fake recess windows like the other side. No, I don't think so. I don't think so. <laughs> I mean, I, what I'm ways. thinking about is there any way to articulate it or to, to but that I think is not going to pull it off. So maybe this is the the only solution. I just I just throw it out there for the board and for the applicant expert, that's all. Do you have any ideas, Jim? No, I, I mean, I think if the stucco is redone and it's, you know, uniform color, it's, it's going to go away, <coughs> and kind of clean it up, and if there yeah. are cars there, kind of very I agree. That's all I have. Okay. Okay, this time I'll open up to members of the public for uh, questions, questions only of the architect. Any questions, please come forward. Thank you, Lee. Uh, Mr. Chairman, that brings me to my last witness, which is uh, Ken Nelson, our plant. Okay. Mr. Nelson, would you raise your right hand? Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you will give to this board will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help you God. State your full name for the record, please. Kenneth Nelson. Thank you. And the board can stipulate to Mr. Nelson's qualifications. He's been accepted by this board on numerous occasions. Okay. As a plan. As, as a, a plan. Yes. Yeah. Mr. Nelson, I have a microphone if you want to walk around and point at things. And if not, we can uh, sit here, sir. We're only going to sit right here. <laughs> okay. Uh, <coughs> first, Mr. Nelson, would you indicate to the board your familiarity with the uh, uh, the town's master plan, the town zoning ordinance, this application, this site, and this neighborhood. Yes, I've uh, visited the uh, site and neighborhood on several occasions. I reviewed the uh, 1994 master plan and the 2017 master plan re-examination report. I'm familiar with the requirements of the uh, B11 zone, and I reviewed Mr. Uh, Phillips' report. And you sat here tonight and listened to the testimony? Yes, I did. If you could then, could you describe the existing conditions, starting with the district it's in and the districts near the property also? Uh, I, I think given the lateness of the hour um, and the thoroughness of the uh, previous uh, witnesses and Mr. Phillips' report, I, I think I can uh, abbreviate my report somewhat in terms of uh, not repeating a lot of what has already been mentioned. But the, uh, 
property is in a small B11 district. There are several of them throughout the uh, municipality, generally small in size, and that's uh, true of uh, this one. Uh, I have uh, a series of photographs that uh, we can distribute that to the board members. I have a series of uh, photographs that uh, show the, uh, the neighborhood and the uh, site, which uh, supplements supplement the photographs that uh, were previously. Dave, is that a packet? It's a packet number then? It's a packet that consists of one, two, four pages with. And each photograph is labeled as to what it Seven is. pictures that I'll mark it as uh, A5 with today's date. I'm sorry, there's four sheets. Uh, one, two, three, four sheets, yes. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, here's all the copies that Mr. Nelson gave you. know what I did not do, Mr. Howard? I don't have to figure this out. We're one of those billboards to the side of the building. I don't think so. <laughs> Okay, we've marked uh, four sheets of pictures which contain uh, seven pictures in total. And Mr. Nelson, could you tell the board what that is, uh, what it shows? The uh, first picture uh, shows the subject property with uh, the billboards that's taken from uh, Fairchild. Uh, the second sheet um, has two photographs. One shows a portion of the residential area on the west side of Fairchild. And the bottom picture shows the uh, uh, B11 zone on the south side of Harlem. The uh, third uh, page has two photographs. The top one shows the uh, firehouse on the corner of Harlem and Fairchild. The bottom photograph shows the B11 zone and the commercial uses on the south side of Harlem. Uh, the last uh, picture shows the uh, front of the property. Uh, the last page shows the front of the property and the top picture and the rear of the property uh, in the bottom picture. The, uh, Just for the record, I think our set might be in a different order. Oh, I'm matter. sorry. At least mine is. Yeah. But the rule's still there. The, uh, the property and the B1, B11 zone uh, is surrounded by an R7 zone, which is uh, single family residential. Uh, I might point out something that I, I found interesting. I'm not sure that it relates directly to this application, but the B11 zone uh, allows all conditional uses permitted in any residential zone. And one of the conditional uses in the uh, R7 uh, is what is referred to as a supplementary apartment. Uh, so there are supplementary apartments allowed in the, uh, in the uh, adjoining residential area. Um, and what we're proposing is a uh, residential component that would have two units. So in theory, some of the single family homes uh, in the R7 zone uh, could also uh, have two units within them. The uh, uh, property is uh, in very close proximity to Morris Plains. Uh, it is also in close proximity to Hanover Avenue. Uh, and the billboards are visible from Hanover Avenue. Uh, the zoning basically reflect, reflects what the existing land development pattern is in the area. Uh, the property is undersized, it's a corner lot. Um, it's, the current use is essentially a neighborhood store. Uh, it's been there for uh, many decades and basically the thrust of this application is to bring this property, the building, the site, uh, from the 1960s into the 21st century. The, uh, the existing commercial use is not a high intensity use. It's a lot of quick in and out traffic. And as has been discussed, uh, the parking, uh, both for the existing commercial use and the proposed apartments, uh, can be easily accommodated on the site. The, uh, Proposal which <coughs> seeks to add two two bedroom apartments um, is actually uh, very much in keeping with something that 
is mentioned in your most recent master plan re-examination report. And if I could just summarize part of it and read the last sentence verbatim. Uh, it's on page 45 of the re-examination report under the heading Changes in Housing Preference. It gets into the uh, uh, baby boomer demographic and the uh, millennial demographic and how they're trending away from traditional large lot single family housing. Um, it indicates that a variety of housing types are also being built as part of new mixed use developments in order to respond to this trend. And the, the last two sentences actually read, although the planning board anticipates that the township will remain a predominantly single family detached home community, it must still be cognizant of these changing housing preferences. As such, it should look for opportunities to promote diversity in the township's housing stock where appropriate. Uh, this is a, a very small project. It, it doesn't make much of a dent in providing a variety of housing types, but in my opinion, it's uh, uh, right on uh, track with, uh, with what is mentioned in the re-examination report. Let me get to uh, the statutory tests. That's, that's obviously the most important part of my testimony. Um, but before I do that, let me, let me mention one thing. This building is an attractive building. I understand Mr. Phillips' uh, concerns about, uh, about the facade, but it's a, it's a major improvement over what is there. Uh, in particular, I think the uh, two overhangs um, actually add an attractive feature to the building so that it isn't just a straight wall up and down. And the brackets, I think, also add to the architectural interest of the building. Uh, and of course, those uh, overhangs uh, create a, uh, a deficiency, a, a variance that, uh, that I have to address in my testimony. Um, I should say that usually C variances uh, are subsumed in the D variance, uh, but I wanted to point out that issue of the overhangs, which I think is uh, is an important factor. Uh, and, and from what I understand, we've eliminated one variance in terms of the coverage. Uh, I'm not sure if moving the dumpster eliminates that variance or not, but it certainly improves uh, efficiency if it, uh, if it does exist. So with respect to the D1 variance, there, the usual argument to be made is that uh, the proposal uh, advances of uh, uh, purposes of zoning, or at least one purpose of zoning. And in my opinion, there are four that are specifically advanced. Uh, I would argue that the site is particularly suited to accommodate these two apartments. It's a one-story building. Uh, the apartments can be accommodated by a vertical expansion, uh, although there is a small increase in the footprint of the building, basically the uh, the proposal is a, is a vertical expansion of the, of the building. Um, and also the location makes this property particularly suited for the use because it is immediately adjacent to a single family residential area that, as I said, can accommodate a second apartment if the property owner so chooses. So these two apartments, this proposal also provides sufficient space in, appropriate, in an appropriate location <coughs> for this uh, niche type of residential use. And finally, and maybe most importantly, as a result of this application, uh, the purpose of zoning related to uh, enhancing the des uh, desirable visual environment or creating a desirable visual envir environment is certainly achieved here, not only by the, uh, the design of the building, but most importantly by the removal of the billboards. So <clears throat> the, uh, the C variances, as I said, are essentially subsumed in the D variance, but if they weren't, uh, my argument would be that the flexible C provision applies to uh, the variances that are, that are needed 
because those variances need to be approved in order to make this project happen. Finally, in terms of the negative criteria test, um, I see very little, if any, impact associated with this project. Uh, I think the impacts are primarily positive. Uh, there may be some slight increase in traffic as a result of adding the two apartments, but uh, that increase will be minimal. Uh, furthermore, I would argue that the, uh, uh, the intent and purpose of the master plan is, and the zone plan is not impaired uh, for the reasons I've stated in connection with providing an appropriate uh, type of residential use at this location. And with respect to the Medici test, I suspect, although I don't know, the fact that the B11 zone is such a small zone throughout the municipality, I, I doubt that the planning board or the council has given a lot of thought to it, or if they have, uh, maybe the thinking is that if there's going to be residential added in these zones, that it would be better to do it via the variance process. Um, so that concludes my testimony. Unless Mr. No, there's no substantial detriment to the there, public good or general welfare. Yeah, I, I'm sorry. There's no, yes, uh, definitely there's, there's uh, no substantial detriment to, uh, to the public good as a, the adjoining properties as a result of uh, this proposal. There's nothing further, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Board members, any questions? Mr. Whitford. Yes, uh, did you take any kind of survey to see how many uh, multifamily houses are like within like, one block radius of the uh, property? No, I didn't. Mr. Howard. I have a question about the billboards. Uh, they were described earlier on as uh, pre-existing non-conforming. I'm not sure that I know what that means, and I'm not sure whether my question is better for you or for Professionals, but why are they there if they're not conforming? Well, I, I don't know the whole history of it, but uh, they may have predated zoning. I don't know. Yeah, basically, if it's pre existing, not conforming, um, it, in most cases, it predated the current zone plan. And when was the current zone plan put in place? You know? Does anyone know? <coughs> no. There's a couple of increments, but I, I don't yeah, know the specific. Yeah, really nice. Seventies, maybe. Seventies. I'll represent Mr. Quillen and Mr. Mayor to just uh, uh, inform me that the billboards there were in 1966 when his parents took over and he was a kid. And they were already there. And they were already there. Yes. Yeah. So the planning act is like 1959. So. And the first zoning ordinance in this town followed shortly thereafter, if I remember right. So sometime in the 60s. So it would seem that those were, they pre-existed any zoning in town. And, there and as a pre-existing use and structure, they would grant their grandfather in the layman's terms and get to remain. All right, that was my only question. <coughs> Yes. Board of Professionals, Mr. Sleep. And no questions. Mr. Mr. Have a couple of questions. And I just want to understand the testimony because you were talking, I thought you were indicating that the two families proposed here would be consistent with the surrounding area. And I know there was a question that was just asked about how many two families, and the surrounding area is RA7, but RA7 is a single family zone and I just wanted to make sure that I understood the your testimony. Are you saying there are two family around it and they may be not conforming or well I according according to my understanding of the ordinance, uh, the R seven allows supplementary apartments. So in theory, I don't know if any so, exist, but there could be two family or there could be structures with two units in them in that neighborhood. Okay, but 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 the but you'll acknowledge that RA7 is a single family. It's, yes, I just want to understand. And then the other question is, um, 
in terms of planning proofs, uh, how much weight would you give to elimination okay. of the non-conforming billboards? What? Yeah, I, I would give a substantial amount of weight to that. In fact, maybe it should have been the first one that I mentioned. Okay. That's all I have. Mr. Chairman, I don't know if it would be helpful to have Mr. Mayer come up, but I just spoke to him. He said there's four or five two-family residences in the surrounding area that he knows of. I'm sorry, how many? Four or five. Four or five. Mr. Nelson, do you need that additional testimony on the record, or? I probably wouldn't hurt, wouldn't hurt that. Mr. Mayer, are you from, are you from, Mr. Mayer, are you familiar with the uh, surrounding land uses? Yes. And to your knowledge, are there any two-family houses in the immediate vicinity? Yes, there's about uh, four or five. Okay, uh, if there's no more questions from the board, I'll open this up to members of the public. Anybody in the public with any questions for um, the planner, please come forward this time. Seeing none, hearing none, close the portion and want me to I'll open up for comments or that's fine okay uh, at this time we'll open it back up to the public for any um, any comments so no, not just questions any comments testimony opinions please come forward seeing none hearing none close the public board. Mr. Chairman I'll, I'll sum up quickly I know you have another uh, hearing you'd like to get to uh, I'm not going to go through it as I would if I was briefing something and explore every rationale for every variance we're going to lump it all into one thing which is we currently have a, uh, a nondescript block commercial looking building. While it's in a commercial zone, it's immediately adjacent to residential zones. It has on top of it two large billboards. Uh, I was looking at the, the uh, A5 and looking at the, the square footage of the billboards and the square footage of the side of the building, it's probably over half the size of the side of that building. Uh, it's, it's, Billboards are uh, in a next to a residential zone like this or something I'm sure that uh, the uh, township uh, would like to discourage or removing them. We're putting up uh, a, a two modest market rate units providing a diversity of housing stock. There's a trend lately to have uh, going back to the old style where you have residential <coughs> above and commercial below. This reflects that trend. It's going to be apartments that are, as I say, modest uh, market rate units close to uh, downtown Morris Plains, close to some of the uh, uh, amenities that you have there. Uh, walkability and all that uh, that people talk about nowadays applies to these. You're going to have a significant upgrade in the aesthetics of this building, um, something that is compatible with the surrounding areas. I think, as I said, I'm not going to go through each, unit, each uh, analysis, but I think as a whole, uh, this is an improvement to the area, an improvement to the town, provides additional housing stock for the town, and an asset to board approved. Thank you. Mr. Oler, um, do you have any conditions that were discussed? I did discuss a few. You know, I just wanted to note one other thing from uh, the yes. exhibits. Um, a5, there's a, uh, it looks like a vending machine in the back. Uh, Pepsi vending machine in the back on the Fairchild side, and then there's also, I don't know if it's a clothing collection box or, or something, but uh, I'm just wondering if the applicant's willing to uh, uh, a condition if the board is to look favorably on this application that no outside, you know, vending machines or storage of materials uh, on the property. Uh, Ms. Murray indicated that the vending machine is already gone. We have to remain on. <laughs> uh, Mr. Mayor said some of the people in, in the area use it and it goes to a good cause, but if the board wants it to be removed from the site, there's no objection. Yeah. That's the clothing. Is that you? I'm not going to be one to get rid of a donation box so of <laughs> 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 the fire department. Then we'll have to come to the board to get approval. We'll throw it <laughs> okay, Mr. Oler, we're going over 
condition. <coughs> yes. Um, we need the um, variance list on sheet three to be updated. Okay, we're eliminating the pavement along the east side of the garage so as to eliminate the impervious coverage variance. Okay. We discussed relocating the dumpster to an area closer to the garage, mm -hmm. but I don't think we actually came up with the location. We're leaving that to Mr. Slate's judgment on recent mail. I think it was my understanding that the engineer needed to explore the relocation and the parking to determine where it could go. Right. So we'll do that and then on resubmittal leave it to the township engineer satisfaction. That's good. Uh, the garage will not be used for residential use. We are reserving the two parking spaces in front of the garage for residential parking with appropriate signage. Again, the light fixtures will be <coughs> modified to reflect um, something more similar to the architect to what's on the architect's plan. If the electrical service needs to be upgraded, then the new service will be run underground. Um, the garage will be repainted to the same color scheme as the building. Uh, dumpster enclosure also will be a color uh, to the same color scheme as the building. Removing all exterior vending machines if there are any. Okay. We're not requiring the removal of the donation box, though. Is that right? Right? No. Uh, Mr. Uh, Schomer indicated there'd probably, probably be a wood fence around the dumpster yeah, and it might be uh, right. pressure treated. Is, is that required to be painted? It would just be a pressure treated wood dumpster and you'll show a spec on resubmit. Okay. Right. That was all I had. That actually was all I had also. I was checking okay. the offers we went. And maybe we can add one more, and that's to have the architect review the, uh, the aesthetics of the Fairchild Avenue side as recommended by Mr. Phillips. Um, just just to ask an issue uh, that uh, Paul and I discussed to bring up to the board. Uh, we, From Mr. Nelson's exhibit, we did see that the uh, parapet wall appears to be about two feet tall, so um, the, uh, I imagine that parapet's going to come down. So the size of that wall, as you're looking at it, comes down. Um, you know, it looks like at least two feet. Maybe the architect, uh, if we need clarification on that, can provide clarification. But that the size of that wall, as it exists, is going to be reduced by you know a couple feet because the parapet wall. Um, you know, that's my understanding where the construction would go. You're not going to build off that parapet wall. Uh, so that kind of helps reduce the scale of, of that, uh, you know, existing wall that faces Fairchild Avenue. Oh. Okay, it, it, I still think, you know, I still agree that the, the that facade is a little blank. <coughs> maybe something as simple as maybe, you know, making the band wider, brackets bigger or something. Just, just take a look at it and see what we can come up with. I have no objection, and then I, I guess we run any Issue or any uh, alternative by Mr. Slate and Mr. Phillips? That sounds good to me. That works. Just as uh, one other note that I had is uh, the uh, township has a, an affordable uh, housing contribution requirement. It's all over the state, but uh, you know, obviously, that's a standard condition in our resolutions, so the applicant should be aware of that. And do we need any documentation regarding the parking spaces in the right of way, or? Defer to Mr. Oh, yeah, I don't think so. I mean, it's a, it's a long-standing, pre-existing condition in the uh, street where you go. Actually, if you look at A5 uh, across the street, it's the exact same condition. Yeah, 
for this driver here, Mr. Chairman. I just want another follow up yes, question from the, uh, from the Mr. Phillips CCC report. Um, there was a recommendation that they drop Belgian block curbing along the whole Fairchild frontage. I didn't hear any mention or discussion of that. Is that something that's it's on the plans? It is on the plans yeah. to do that. And then so, because right now you can just, on the Fairchild side, you can just pull it and park, right? So that Belgian block will be that you'll not be able to just sort of pull in and park. No, you would be, but it would delineate kind of the, the uh, traveled way from the parking area. Yeah, so it's depressed Rock. curb. Oh, it depressed. basically, okay. it's, it, gotcha. it wasn't finished by us, and we're gotcha. refining out. Gotcha. So, right. Thank you for clarifying that. And then one other item that I forgot to mention earlier was, I did notice it seems to be an oversized satellite dish also on the rear of the building. Um, is that intended to stay or go back onto the top of the new structure, or is that coming down to being removed also? That's the lottery dish. <laughs> so you need that to sell lottery tickets. So where will that go? Oh, will that go on the roof? I mean, it's a fairly large sized dish. Will that go on the roof of the new structure? We haven't thought that through, frankly. So it would really it needs to be there because. Well, it needs to be. Well, if you need to continue to sell lottery tickets, it needs to be somewhere. But the site of a, a dish that size on the top of this structure would really stand out as obtuse, in my opinion. Thank you. I don't believe it's visible at any of the photos. Yeah, just barely. Rear property photo, you can see part of it. Yeah. You know, you know, Mr. Charles, <coughs> we uh, have a condition that we'll review that with Mr. Slate and Mr. Phillips and, and ascertain the best location on the building to put that. I think that's fine. It looks like there's some roof lines in that back corner that we can keep it behind the uh, the bridge line yeah. and mm -hmm. not, not be that visible. Thank you. And then my final comment is having to again walk the property when you first come upon the property, especially in the rear, it's a little overwhelming in terms of trying to delineate on first sight of what belongs to which building, the liquor store, you know, then you look over to the right, there's a private residence there. Um, the photo that's provided here, the rear of the property, I would say that's uh, not really an indicator of what's actually there right now. There's a, a, a number of large items, an old landscaping trailer, and I was not aware that the um, applicant actually owns the property next door. So can we just get some uh, intention of that debris field that's sort of there right now with the trailer and all the, the stuff? Is that intended to just be moved next door or to take it off site? Well, one, one part of the site improvements here, we're going to get that back organized per uh, whatever exhibit was that Mr. Schomer was showing. So we have delineated parking, we have a place for the dumpster, Great. We have parking for the residents, and they're going to have to be able to get to that parking and not have something in the way. So that gets all cleaned up as part of the general cleaning of the site. And, and our condition, I think, on the removal of the vending machine that's gone already would basically also include language, no outdoor storage of materials. Right. That's why we have a garage. Thank you. Did we have any discussion about what the buffer between the two property lines really was going to be? System instead of shrubbery. Should we leave that to uh, Mr. Slate's uh, good judgment? He loves landscaping conditions. <laughs> the details are on the plan, which you refer to switch. <laughs> I guess we didn't discuss it. No, we didn't. Mr. Brad, why don't you come up for a minute? Currently, how often is a dumpster pickup? Once, once a week, usually Tuesday morning, early morning. You see any change to that? Any reason to change that? 
It's a no. That's a no. That's it. Unless the board has some particular concern, we just continue uh, to pick it up in that that day, as long as it's okay with the hauler or whatever day. You say early in the morning. I think he's in like five o'clock, six o'clock. But the residence is above there. Him up the garbage. Well, it's in a B eleven zone. It's a commercial. Right, right. right. You're asking for residence. Well, the trucks come down my street about 5.45 or so. I don't, think well, goes, I, think we're good. I don't think the goes on there now is any different. Yeah. In my town, they come around 5.30. All right. Okay, we'll leave it. I'm good. You good? I'm good. Okay, and okay. yeah, if there's no more discussions on conditions, I'll accept the motion at this time. I'd like to make a motion that we accept and approve this application based upon the uh, conditions that we'll find. Thank you, Mr. Williams. Do we have a second? I'll second that. Thank you, Mr. Stout. Ms. Mantek, can we have a roll call, please? Mr. Goldberg? Yes. Mr. Quillen? Yes. Mr. Williams? Yes. Mr. Woodford? Yes. Mr. Stout? Yes. Mr. Christensen? Yes. Mr. Crom? Yes. Okay. Application is approved. We'll be memorialized at the meeting next month. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman and members. As long as he gets a transfer. Quickly. I guess you need that transfer. That's all I want to be the meeting after. Okay. okay. And there's good. Okay, I guess this would be a good time to take a five-minute yeah, recess before we start the next applications. Yeah. Yeah.